times that we're in? How do we relate to them? What is God's will? What is not? And so I spent a lot, a lot of time in looking at these things. What's interesting about this book is, let me read actually the sleeve. It'll kind of give you an idea. Can I do that real quick? Check this out. I'll tell you why. It says in 1346, a catastrophic plague beset Europe and its neighbors. The Black Death was a human tragedy that abruptly halved entire populations and caused untold suffering. But it also brought about a cultural and economic renewal on a scale never before witnessed. The world the plague made is a panoramic history of how the bubonic plague revolutionized labor, trade, technology, and set the stage for Europe's globalism. So anyway, it says that this writer, James Bellick, takes readers across the centuries and continents to shed new light on one of history's greatest paradoxes. Why did Europe's dramatic rise begin in the wake of the Black Plague? And you're going to see why they released plagues. You're going to see. Bellick shows how plague doubled the per capita endowment of everything, even as it decimated the population. Less Georgia Guidestones, bye-bye, time capsule, plagues, new economy. And many more people had disposable incomes because of the plague. Demand grew for silk, sugar, spices, furs, gold, and slaves. Europe expanded to satisfy that demand, and plague provided the means for it. Labor scarcity drove more use of technology. Is this fascinating? Water power, wind power, and gunpowder. Technologies <clears throat> like water power, blast furnaces, heavily gunned galleons, musketry, fast-tracked by the plague. The new crew culture of disposable males emerged to man the guns and the galleons. It set the rise of Western Europe globalism. He also demonstrates how the mighty empires of the Middle East and Russia also flourished after the plague and how European expansion was deeply entangled with the Chinese and others throughout the world. <laughs> it's a playbook. The book Neo-Feudalism uh -huh. became a lot of the same conclusions yeah. as Mm -hmm, sure. So they came. That's interesting. We have two different researchers coming to the same. Conclusion. And this is thorough. This is it, guys. We're talking about they know what they're doing. This is medievalism, uh, neo medievalism. This is the dark ages. We're moving back into the dark ages. Why? Because this is where you can have global monopolies. The, the, the dark ages is why you had, and you know, the Bible identifies the 1260 year prophecy the papal power, this apostate kind of churchianity that was geopolitical and a perse persecution power. And how the Bible does talk about that there is an image to that that rises up, and that's the whole American prophecy stuff that's very fascinating. And how, I mean, all the way back in like 2008, 2009, I was you know, talking about some some a lot of this kind of a stuff saying it's going to happen. It's going to happen. They're going to use plagues to do it. They already had nine 11. Next thing is probably going to be the Hoover dam where they bring LA into crises and everything else, but they have to release these things to go into this utopian vision. That's going to be a hellscape. It's going to be a neo feudalism. And it's going to be a march backwards into dark ages, new dark ages, a time in which you have dynasty families. So you're going to see all family intrigue and everyone posture themselves for that new era so they could be a dynasty family, right? And that's what you have now. You have all these Arab families, Chinese families, Turkish families. You have these American families. These European families are all positioned to be these dynasty families. It's true. And this is what we're, this is what's happening. And the Bible predicts that we're going to move back into that. And that's where you're going to get this neo-papal power that's going to be globalist. Very fascinating, the times in which we're in. And you're going to see that as we're into the Thyatira study that we're looking into here, 
is you're going to see that's going to be characterized by this Jezebel age in which you're going to now it's going to be the rise of Elisha, the Elisha message. Now, you guys know who Elisha is, right? The prophet. He's written more in the book of Kings than any king. Chapter after chapter after chapter in the book of Kings. So why is Elisha, who's not a king, more mentioned in the book of Kings than any of the kings? I'll give you a clue. Do you, you know, like if you were to look at the book of Revelation as like kind of a, a play, you know, it's very interesting. It's kind of almost, it's set almost like a Greek play in a lot of ways, but it's also very fascinating how the book of Revelation is kind of, has a grammatic structure. What's fascinating is, the villain, the villainry is going to be a woman who's a harlot, who's also sits in power, and the kings of the earth. You'll see this thing, the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth. You'll see it all through, the kings of the earth. And so you're going to have the kings of the earth versus this measure, this message that's coming that basically takes down this Jezebel power. She's sitting, she's ruling, she's reigning. The kings of the earth are supporting her. And then there's a message of the gospel, the everlasting gospel that brings plagues and the outpouring of the latter rain. So during the time of Elisha, was there the withholding of the rain? For three and a half years, right? And then there was the release of that rain. And this was the beginning of the, of the end of Jezebel. Very fascinating. So if you take biblical parallels the book of Revelation is drawing from everything that preceded it in, in the Bible. Everything that's in the stories, that's how you unlock the book of Revelation. If you really want to unlock Revelation, you've got to know what it's accessing in its imagery. See, that's what we're doing. So that's what we're going to be looking at, you guys. We're going to be spending some time in this kind of scope of Jezebel, Elisha, who is a John the Baptist. Remember, they both had the camel's hair clothes. They were both basically exiled outside the walls of Jerusalem. They, what's fascinating is that you had Ahab, bless you, with Jezebel, and you had Herod with Herodias. This woman that should not be his wife, and John the Baptist is calling them out, and they want him killed. And it was the same thing back in Elisha's time. This woman should not have married this king. She was a member of Phoenician. She was a Sidonian. These were the international globalists of the time. These were the ones that created the entire merchandise trade system and the entire concept of a gathering archives and creating narrative around history and everything else in a romantic scheme. Romanticism was developed by the Phoenicians. So when you watch a movie and they use a formula or like I took screenplay writing. When I was in college, I went to Cabrillo. And I took screenwriting and I got an A in screenwriting because I already knew that it's based upon Phoenician storytelling. That there are certain structures that they use on the third act. There's this is an almost resolved. It looks like it's going to get resolved. It doesn't get resolved. There's a new crisis introduced, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all Phoenician tales. So narrative around history, around how we identify ourselves. Like, for example, America first identified themselves with the concept of pilgrims, right? Thanksgiving, et cetera. And then we needed a new narrative. So we had the Civil War, new narrative. The great sacrifice of 600,000 people, right? 600,000 people died in the Civil War. Is that correct? How many? It's 800. But the narrative is 600. Do you know why? How many people entered into the desert at the exodus of Egypt? 600,000. Every juice note says that. Is that fascinating? And then you have a new narrative, World War II. Well, first it was World War I, but that didn't work very good. World War II, we had to kind of do a redo. So United Nations, globalism, world stage. Well, we needed to kick it in again. So we had this thing called what? 9-11, right? And 9-11, you have the two towers of Jacob and you have this whole song, this whole Solomon Freemason kind of sacrificial thing. How many people died in the Twin Towers? 3,000. How many people died on Mount Sinai with the calf worship? 3,000. How many people were converted at Pentecost? 3,000. These are narratives. 
doesn't matter. They don't want the numbers exact. They just want these certain narratives. And then we're going to base our identity on these narratives. And we think that, quote, history is really just a strict scientific gathering of facts. No, it's not. The Sidonians develop the entire process of we have a schematics. We take the information that fills these schematics, and there's a certain narrative involved. And so we can have this sense of identity. It's very fascinating when you get into it. So this is a reset. As they keep calling it, right? The Great Reset, something like that. Is that what they're saying? It's a redo. And what's the whole purpose of it? This utopian society. We're cycling back into problem, reaction, solution. From the ashes comes a great society, a great civilization. And so at the end of every, quote, empire civilization, but now it's a global empire, global civilization. And the book of Revelation makes it clear that this is Satan's scheme that he calls Babylon. Right? So it's very fascinating. So we got to get a hold of this idea that when King Ahab, who's supposed to be a Jewish king, is now bringing in this globalist named Jezebel who was a complete psychopathic narcissist and uses all the schemes of intrigue and everything else to be working through Ahab to develop the entire priestcraft of the Baals, etc. So what I'm going to do is uh, we'll get started in our study here. Let's check this out. <laughs> Jesus talks about this bizarro situation and christ is trying to say i don't think you guys understand the signs of the times elisha was here in the form of john the baptist what does that tell you we just had elisha here you guys they're like huh you mean elisha was actually here literally okay parallel <laughs> you know what i mean it's the elisha times so let's go ahead and look at this real quick and jesus is trying to tell them matthew chapter 16 verses 1 to 4 we're talking about the signs of the times. Remember, the children of Israel kept asking for signs and saying, you guys don't even see what's happening right around you right now. Matthew 16, verses 1 to 4. All right, who wants to read? I'll read. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. You'll see here, you're going to see this story, the same situation with Luke. Luke is going to tell the story again. We're going to get into it in a sec. But what he's trying to say is, I'm going to give you a sign. It's going to be the Jonah sign. So what's the Jonah sign, right? Anyone know? The whale. Jonah and the whale, right? What happened to Jonah? He what's that, Sarah? He didn't go yeah, he was sending him to Nineveh. He goes right to confront because we always have a confrontation, bro. No, none of us want the drama of confrontation. I get it. So he avoids it and he goes to Tarshish, right? And then we know Paul from Tarshish. Any, anybody's on this journey to Tarshish is an interesting study, just the whole Tarshish journey. That was, believe it or not, Sidon. That was Tarsh. That was Tyre. That, that was the area that you go to get rich. That's where you go where they had a bunch of trade and trafficking and boats and you know, they had day spas, they had an IMAX theater, they had two Costco's there. Basically, it's where you go. And what's interesting, it was the picture of where you go to literally make your riches. Uh, you go on an exotic journey. It's all this exotic trade there. They had a Pier 1 import and everything else. It just, they had a, it was just this amazing kind of place. These huge shopping malls, bazaars, everything else. And they had the purple robes and the purple dye and everything else. And God says, no. You're going actually to Nineveh, right? And then what happens with J Jonah on the way to Tarshish? God sends him where? First, before he goes to Nineveh, where does he take him? To the belly of the whale. And then just read Jonah's prayer. He's praying one of the Psalms, and he's basically saying, you sent me into a hellish existence, and this is what it's a living death. 
what I'm going through. And God forces him into an introspection until he says he cried out to the sanctuary above, to the temple above, and asked God to help him. And then at this point, the, the whale did what? It vomited him out, right? You guys know the ingredient that makes a super expensive perfume super expensive? People that know this, I mean, that know the whole perfume word, vomit, whale vomit. That's what gives it that long lasting smell, that fishy, fishy, super deep, deep. You can't get rid of it. It's whale vomit. Whale vomit is so valuable. If you find whale vomit, get it. You're rich. <laughs> Perfume companies pay top dollar for whale vomit. Yeah, isn't that fascinating? So I, I, in irony, this whole idea of purple and the whole the shellfish from beneath and the smelly purple robes, etc. Well, he became the embodiment of that. He went down into the belly, the deep, dark places and met with all of his sins. And he became super introspective to the point where he confessed his sinfulness and finally the whale vomit. And then he makes his way to Nineveh and he has a total repentance from top to bottom, right? He really preaches this message. And Christ is a sign of him being, you know, dead, buried and on the third day. He comes back up, whale vomit. But let's go to Luke chapter 12. Because the, the sign is, you guys understand the clouds when they're forming and the sunset and all this stuff, but you don't even know really what's happening right now. And I believe this is the times we're in now. We're in the Jezebel times. We should be reading the times. We should be a part of this whole Elisha message. So Luke chapter 12, and we'll start with verse 49. And uh, 49 to 56, whoever wants to read that. Luke 12, 49 to 56. I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to earth, give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Stop real quick for the next verse. Obviously, God is a reconciler of families, right? You see that in the book of Malachi. I'm going to turn the hearts of the sons of the, towards the fathers and the fathers of the sons, etc. This is unique times. It's a dividing message. This is where Elisha comes in. It's like, choose you this day. It's the same thing when Joshua did this. Choose you this day, and it's going to create division. Those are strange times where God is now dividing households. His whole purpose is to unite the households. You don't know the signs of the times. You have to make a choice. There are those that are united with Satan, unbeknown to themselves. And now when you hear the gospel, you're going to have to choose. Like Nineveh did. Ironically, Nineveh chose the gospel, and the Jews did not. Jonah went to the Gentiles and they received the gospel. Jonah was a prophet of the Northern tribes, by the way, when, when they were separated, you know, the North and the South. And the North was in full apostasy. They did not choose the gospel, but Nineveh did. So go ahead, read verse 53. Oh, 54, you're right. Then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the West, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weathers, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Yeah, you don't discern the signs of the time. Another version says in verse 53 and 54, they will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother. And Jesus said to the crowds, as soon as you see a cloud rising in the west, you say a shower is coming. What is that an image of? Elisha, right? Remember Mount uh, Carmel, and he's with that battle with the prophets of Baal, and he's praying seven times after that thing. And it says that now... Uh, a cloud is coming from the west, the size of what? The hand of a man. And then it starts to open up. And now this outpouring happens. And it says that a shower is coming. And that is what happens. And when the south wind blows, you say it will be hot. And it is. So if you go to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 44, this is what it references. Like in your margins, it'll probably reference this. 1 Kings 18:44.
it's the time of showers. Now, remember, the punishment for Ahab marrying Jezebel was the showers are withheld for three and a half years. And you will see the theme of three and a half years all through the book of Revelation. Three and a half is half of what? Seven. And you'll see that when God cuts a seven and a half, it's significant. It's very interesting when he cuts seven and a half. The idea of cut where you get like karat, karat in Hebrew, it means like to cut something so you could see what's in it. So Jesus was cut three and a half years into his ministry. You're going to see who that is. When you cut, you kill him. He's put to death. If he rises from that tomb, who did we just murder? You just cut him in half. You just found out who you murdered, him who is life. He's the fountain of life. He just emerged from, from a tomb. Watch this. Go ahead. First Kings 18.44. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. The west. So he said, Go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot, and go down before the rain stops you. This is the idea of he's a forerunner. And this is where God said to Elisha, how can you run with the chariots when you can't even run with the footmen right now? Because it's going to be fast movement. It's going to be, it's this picture that the book of Daniel chapter 12 says, there's going to be knowledge will increase and many will shall run to and fro. It's the idea that these are unique times and messages are moving fast. There is quick movement in both evil and in good. Everything's been expedited. Everything's been put on the fast track and you don't even see the signs uh, in what you're in. So go to the book of Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah has so much prophecy in there that much of the imagery that we get, like the four horses and all these plague bowls and all that stuff all come out of Zechariah. We should be masters of Zechariah if you want to understand Revelation. People just only focus on Daniel, but Zechariah, huge amount. Zechariah's near the end of the Old Testament, just before Matthew. Yeah, there you go. Chapter 14 is the last chapter. And you're going to see this concept. What is the Feast of Tabernacles? A lot of people think, well, we should be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. They get into this whole kind of ceremonialism, blah, 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 blah. But all the feasts in the Bible are representational of Christ's work. Mm -hmm. They're just pictures of the work of redemption and salvation. So you'll see the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll talk about like the idea that you live, quote, in a tabernacle. You have a, so when God traveled through the wilderness with the children of Israel, he had a thing called the tabernacle, right? Mm -hmm. And that tabernacle represented Christ's earthly ministry. He tabernacle, he dwelt amongst us. The word dwelt is tabernacle. The word for grace it's a great word in Hebrew. A lot of people think grace is unmerited favor. I guess that's one way to put it, but that's too abstract for the Hebrew. Hebrew means, it just literally means to pitch your tent next to somebody. Grace means that you're going to live next to somebody. You're thinking, well, how is that grace? You're there for what purpose? To help them, to pay attention, to watch over them, to make sure that if they have any assistance, you're there. You move next to them to give them a hand. It's like kind of home health care, right? You're going to like live there and you're going to help them out. That's what the word grace means. So when Christ came to this earth, he came as the grace of God. It's not just something that comes from God. It's God himself. He came to tabernacle with us. He came to help. He yoked himself. Even the word mercy in Hebrew means to bend your neck to make yourself equal with somebody. That means that I'm going to bend my neck, share your yoke, and I'm going to take your burdens on myself. If they're your problems, they're not my problems. They're our problems. That's the word mercy. See what the understanding of the mercy seat is? God has made your problems his problem. Is that, is that awesome? I love that quality about God. In other words, but also his riches is now our riches. His beautiful kingdom is now ours as if it is our own. Praise God, right? That's mercy. <laughs> and grace is the idea that he's going to dwell with us. So to tabernacle is the idea of dwelling with. So the Feast of Tabernacles is when Christ comes in the clouds of glory, he resurrects the dead, gives them a new body. And the saints, it says, in a moment, in what? A twinkle of, a flash of an eye, he will give you a new tabernacle. And that's represented by the new temple called Solomon's glorified temple. So the body you have now you're wondering why you have so many problems 
following God, obeying God, being a channel for God to work through. Well, that's represented as the wilderness tabernacle, the one with the badger skins on it. But the glorified temple is the one that Christ worked out in his own body, that when he gives it to us on the resurrection, you become as Solomon's temple, the temple of peace, where there is no adversarial relationship you have with God. You have a new you have a new body where there's nothing that fights God. Praise God, right? If you looked in Solomon's temple, they all said, that's a temple. And that is a picture of what Christ worked out in his own flesh to hand to you. He tabernacled with us so he can give us a permanent tabernacle. And that's what he has promised us on that resurrection. My body will be your body. You, where I communed with God and the Holy Spirit, was communing between us and we're all together in this union. I know the mind and the heart of God. His law is written upon my heart. A body is thou prepared for me so I can give you at my return, my temple. And my temple, my tabernacle will be a gift to you where God can traffic with you like Jacob's ladder, no problem. Before you even ask for an answer, the answer is given. The same communion I have with the Father is my gift to you. You will have it in your being as a gift. Praise God, right? That's the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is, so a lot of people think, well, Jesus was born December 25th, was he? No, who was probably born then? Tammuz or something, god. right? Yeah, some sun god thing, some equinox stuff. Reality, when you go back and you do the homework and you realize, okay, he was born, is right, probably right around, I mean, he she was uh, conceived at this time, et cetera, et cetera. By the time you work it all out, he fell either exactly on the day of or right around within a few days of the Feast of Tabernacles. Does that make sense? He came to tabernacle with us. He was born in the fall after the Day of Atonement. And so they had the census. They knew that they were going to get the Jews because on the Day of Atonement, you didn't have to be in Jerusalem, but on Tabernacles, you did. So guess what? Everyone had to go back to Jerusalem. They had the census. All the Jews had to go back to their hometown, right? For what purpose? Because Caesar was taking the registry, et cetera, for taxes. So he lined it up with the Feast of Tabernacles. So Jesus came to tabernacle amongst us. So when we read Zechariah 14, keep in mind, the Feast of Tabernacles is not about us keeping a feast and wearing zitzits and a yarmulke and, and having Seder, as some people think that's what we're supposed to do. It's a picture of it's the coming of Christ and we're soon to receive our new bodies. He's about to bring us to the ultimate temple so we can tabernacle with God. When you see a reference in eschatology to the Feast of Tabernacles, my friends, it is Christ coming to get his people that where he is, there we may be also. Amen? Zechariah 14, verse 16 to 21. Go ahead, Paige. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of the hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. No rain. You, you're noticing the no rain theme? We'll get into that in a sec. Right around the tabernacle time. Interesting. Go ahead. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that do not come up to the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Think about the plague bowls. Go ahead. Yes. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. And that day there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now, this is interesting kind of Jewish little code language for holiness to the Lord is what the high priest wore on his forehead. When the high priest represented you or, you know, people that are coming to God, he's presenting his holiness to the Lord. That's what Christ is. Do you think I want me to represent my holiness before the Lord? 
I would become smoking powder before God if I said, look at my holiness, God. Zap, twitching ionic powder. That's all I would become. I cannot come before the infinite God presenting my holiness where God's going, cool, yeah, Dave, yeah, for sure. Based on your righteousness, Dave, yeah, come on in. You deserve it. That, that pile of gold, that's all yours. That's not how it's going to play out. I need a high priest that I could hide behind and say, don't look at me. Look at my high priest. Holiness to the Lord is how God has to see you to give you your new tabernacle. Nobody's getting a resurrected body so you could be before the Lord without, quote, your high priest standing there. And it says that he's going to filter out. There's going to be no rain. And he's going to filter out. The idea of no rain, you guys, okay, just a little kind of a Jewish kind of educational thing is in the springtime they had these feasts right passover unleavened bread Pe pentecost these are things we've heard about that's all in the springtime during the rains and then there's a no rain period during the summertime and then there's the fall rain period where you had the feast of trumpets which is you go through the ten commandments and you examine yourself for ten days then the day of atonement, which is on the 10th day, you're examining yourself according to the 10th commandment, coveting your own sinful nature. Five days after that is the Feast of Tabernacles. That happens to be the day that most people got married, by the way. Is that there? It's because you're building a new home with somebody. Makes sense, right? The wedding day, Christ comes for his bride. Makes a lot of sense. So the Feast of Tabernacles, it's interesting. It's pictured in the book of Revelation as these seven bowls. Now, in a Jewish wedding where you got married, you drink seven cups called the Shiva's Brokat. You get married. You, you lift the veil of the woman. It's interesting. No more veil. You're now face to face. And then you drink the seven cups of blessing. Christ says, I will not drink of the cup until what? I come for my wife and I bring her home and I went to go prepare a place for her that where I am there, she may be also. I'm going to lift her veil and we're going to drink and become famously drunk. We're going to be so intoxicated with each other. We're going to forget what time, what day it is. A day is going to feel like a thousand years and a thousand years is going to feel like a day. That's the picture, actually. Is that beautiful? But on the flip side, those seven bowls are seven boiling pots in which they boiled the flesh in the tabernacle and all the scum came to the top and they poured those bowls out. And it was the idea that God boils you. Why did why do the wicked get boils at the end of time? It's from boiling. It boils everything to the surface where it says that they repented not and they cursed God. So God boiled Job. He had boils. And found out what was inside of Job came to the surface, which is what? I trust God. And I have a redeemer and a mediator. Ah, it's been discovered. The patience of Job, you'll see in the book of James. The 144,000, well, it says in the book of Revelation, will be people who are alive at the time of Christ and they'll go through a great purging. And everything that's hidden beneath will be brought to the surface. Bless you. And what's interesting is God will allow his people to go through an affliction, a trial. Even if you were to go through the Old Testament, it says, I will turn Jerusalem into a boiling pot. And everything that will be hidden and lodged deep within will be boiled out to the surface, right? Isn't that why you have fevers? What's fevers good for? Cooking the virus. Getting down into that thing that's lodged in there saying, oh, no, you don't. We're turning up the furnace. The virus goes, okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right? That's why you take even like there's like cayenne treatments and stuff like that to get rid of parasites. Parasites go, okay, I can't deal with the heat. Parasites out after the cayenne goes in. Hey, just sit outside for like an hour and a half. Well, there you go. <laughs> and so what do you have is God says, I will quote, these pots are kind of the opposite or the flip side of these wedding cups. I'm going to show you why they're not my bride. She's holding a cup filled with her self-intoxicating thing where it says, I see no sorrow. I don't care. I'm presumptuous. I'm drunk on my own golden cup, my wine of Babylon. And she's self-intoxicated and she has no insight into herself whatsoever. And what you're going to see, and this is for probably the next study, is we're really going to get into why God has a sea of glass mingled with fire. That's the laver. That is a picture of a bronze tub that they had. And it looked like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And it's a point of self-reflection before you go into that temple. And once you see these things about yourself, you are there to wash your hands and your feet to say, okay, God, cleanse me. 
I have a wicked heart. I have bad intentions, right? Self-reflection is the beginning of every parole board meeting, right? They want to know, do you have any insight into why you did what you did? They don't want to sit there and go, oh, it wasn't my fault. These are extended waiting circumstances. They don't want to hear all that garbage. They just want to know that you have some insight into your accountability because that happens to be the beginning of what? A new heart. I used to tell people about my brother, Tim, who stole from everybody. And his big speech is like, no, you could trust me. You could trust me. That was a bizarre situation. He ripped off everybody. Sorry, Tim. I love you, but you've been exposed. No, I'm kidding. He's in prison. He doesn't mind. And um, the reality is, is that I said, don't trust him until he tells you you can't trust him. If he's convincing you that you can trust him, do not trust him. If he's telling you, no, I can be trusted. No, I've changed. My I've changed. Don't believe him. You know who the change person is? Don't trust me. I don't trust myself. Ah, that sounds like a repentant person. Man, I can't even trust myself. I'm telling you don't trust me. Because I completely lie to myself all the time. I need to be realistic with myself. Then you see the beginning of that. And that is really the saints at the end of time. Look not upon me. Look upon him. Don't look at my righteousness. Look upon him. And the wicked have no insight into themselves. They're rich in increase of goods. They have need of nothing. They have that mentality of I don't care. They, you try to give them insight. They go, what is that to me? That's your problem. Yeah, it's a narcissist. It's someone who projects says, no, that's your problem. That's not my problem. You just got a problem with me because I'm so amazing. You're just jealous, right? So back to our study. This actually is our study. But God says that I will not allow the Canaanite to, to come through. I'm pouring bowls out. And those seven bowls are going to be upon those that in their heart of hearts have no love of God. And he's going to expose them by bringing a great darkness upon God's people, upon this world. A darkness in which those that are in that darkness will either trust God and sing songs in the night and trust him even though he's silent, like Jonah in the belly of the whale, calling out to God, or they will curse God and mitigate their pain through their warfare against God. Even Job's wife says, why don't you curse God and die? He says, I won't do it. I would rather endure my suffering and get an answer from God than curse him. And, and this is what the wicked do at the end of time. Every single person will be tested in this way. Now we have this sign to the times, the looking for clouds. You don't understand. You're in the time of Jezebel. You have Herod and Herodias. You are rejecting John the Baptist, who's a type of Elijah. I show up. And you guys are ready to murder me. Don't tell me you guys know the signs of the times. You have no concept. You're in allegiance with the prophets of Baal. Go to Luke chapter 4, verse 16. We move on. I have a question. Sure you do. Uh, it's a translation thing. Sure. I've um, been comparing the English Standard Version with the King James. Mm -hmm. they, do, they translate it the Feast of Booths. I've never heard that translation. Oh, it's the same thing, yeah. You build yeah, a booth. Right. Tabernacle or booth. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what they would do, they would take five different branches, like they would take the box tree, the fir, mm -hmm. the uh, acacia, I forget the other ones, and then they would make a booth out of it, and they called it a tabernacle or a booth. Okay. It's it's, it's like, yeah. Or, or, or it's just, it's the same word. It's a booth, or like the Jews would call it the Feast of Booths because they would make a booth. It's like a little tiny tabernacle. And they literally like would be in it for, you know, the whole feast and they would they would live in their house because they saw it as being on that journey to um, the Canaan land. So they called the booths, Feast of Booths. The Jews would call it Feast of Booths. We would call it Feast of Tabernacles. It's just you're building a little uh, tabernacle or a booth or a, a sh you could call it the Feast of uh, Sheds. Yeah, yeah. They still do to this day. They they will for that feast, they will they'll eat there and. Okay, this is important. This is, I'm glad you brought this up because this helps me to bring something up that I think is kind of cool. Is the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, is kind of the opposite of the Day of Atonement. That just happened, by the way. The Day of Atonement is you bring no fruit. You are not bringing your thanks offering or anything. The only thing you could bring on the Day of Atonement is you're afflicting yourself. 
and you are bringing the sin offering. You are in deep, deep introspection because you just had 10 days of what's called also like the, the Feast of Trumpets is also called the, the Feast, the, the Days of Awe. You're going, wait a minute. How's the trend? It's the same thing. You are taking 10 days to go through each of the 10 commandments to see where you've sinned, right? Because we know that sin is what? The transgression of the law. So you're going to take all day on feast on day one, which is what? What's the, what's the first commandment? Other gods. So you go, well, I don't bow down to other gods. I'm not a Hindu. The stupid Hindus. Dumb statues, whatever. And then we start realizing we got all day now. You prayed for the Holy Spirit. You got all day. Before you know it, other gods, gods start taking on newer meanings, right? What are my gods? You've already dismissed it off of, well, I don't bow down to statues, but do you have other gods? The Holy Spirit's kind of, you know what? What? Who's that knocking? Hi, it's me, the Holy Spirit. What? What do you want? I already took care of the no other gods thing. Can I go on with my business? We got some gods to talk about, right? Money, social media. Anything. Your image. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's day two. That's thou shalt not have no image. Mm -hmm. Ah, your image is now. You see, this is going to, this gets deep. By the time you're like, take my name in vain, take your, I don't say GD. I never say GD. I say, gosh, golly. That's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think, gosh, golly. <laughs> but taking his name in vain means you're calling yourself, right? Taking somebody's name in vain is means you're bearing his name. What is the name in Hebrew? Is Shin, their character. You're calling yourself this, but you're really this. I want to be treated as if I'm a child of God, but I certainly don't want to, what, act like a child of God. Oof. Name in vain becomes really painful when you spend, quote, all day with the Holy Spirit. Before you know it, you feel like, oh, no. I'm already violated three commandments. If you're on to the fourth commandment, keep the Sabbath holy. I go to church on, you know, Friday sundown, Saturday sundown. I'm cool. Everyone else are going first day or they're going on Friday because they're Muslim or Wednesday or whatever. But then you say, well, keep it holy. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means resting in Christ. Do you really rest in Christ? Is he your righteousness? Are you under his canopy? Are you the bride and he's the husband? Is is he really the Lord of your heart? Is he the Lord, your righteousness? Is he really your husband? The Sabbath is a, all is a matrimonial picture. It's, it's all in the feminine language. It's the only commandment that has the word holy in it. It's about a wife coming underneath the lordship of her husband. And it's a sign between the wife and the husband that I'm under your dominion. You're the ones who created the heavens. You created the entire climate in which I find my peace. Do I honor that? Are you my Lord? Are you my righteousness? Or my self-righteous? Am I harlot? Am I arrogant, dismissive? Do I just do what I want? I'm self-willed. Okay, let's get past that. That's a little too painful. All right, that's fine. Okay, four, zero out of four. Let's get down to finally something I do do. Honor your father and your mother. Man, I got them in the best rest home in all of Jerusalem. I can go and visit them every week. I bring them their box of Whitman chocolates. I say hi. But what's really honoring your mother and your father? Go to the book of Proverbs and it starts to become apparent what that is and it becomes deeper and deeper. What it really means to honor mother and father. God's your father. So we, we move into these deeper things around authority. So that's the longevity of life. That's the first promise. That's the first command with the promise. Why is that? Because how are you with authority? You have a problem with authority? I do. I know I do. I have a huge. That's why I joined the Navy. I want to know if I could ever trust authority. Because I didn't know, even if authority was good, I didn't even know if I didn't know how to not rebel. That's all I know is I see authority, I go, rebel. I see a cop, rebel. I see someone who's in authority, rebel. I have, a, I have an authority issue. All right, all right, those suck. I need other commandments to go on. All right, thou shalt not murder. <laughs> never murdered, well, <clears throat> I've never really murdered anybody. Well, yeah, that, that's all I'm thinking. That uh, that gopher, man, kicked him to death. I, I feel sick to this day that I did that. I know there is some serious, I pray that squirrel is a part of the resurrection so I can say I'm sorry with tears and he could be my friend throughout eternity. I really hope I can make it up to him. But murder is made up of what? Hatred in your heart, resentment, bitterness. 
there is a form of death that seems to be the the thread through all of that. And then, okay, okay, I'm a non-forgiving person. You know, at least moved on to adultery. I've been faithful to my girl, but what about the lust in your heart? What about, are you vi violating the intimacy? Do you have emotional affairs? Do you like, it just goes on and on and on. And then when you get into the chiastic thing where first commandment connects to last commandment, second commandment connects to ninth commandment, third commandment connects to the eighth commandment. Once you do that, you realize that the Sabbath goes along with adultery. Am I a good wife to Jesus Christ? Do I chase other gods, other husbands? Oh, this is horrible. And it keeps going on bearing false testimony. I don't really lie. I totally pay my taxes. Superficial, right? Super. I love being superficial because it keeps me from doing this deeper work. Bearing false witness is more than just not cheating on your taxes or not lying or it's not even just a little white lies. What is bearing false witness in a lot of ways? How you, what, exaggerate, how you nuance, how you misrepresent something so you look better. How you will cast shade on someone else through nuances and how you play these little Yea, hath God said. Remember the word yea in the word Hebrew where that's where Satan, right? Isn't that his first introduction into Eve is yea. So here's the Hebrew word yea. You guys ready for it? It's great. It's a great Hebrew word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it to you now. <laughs> that's all he did. He went, <laughs> really? Is that, what, is that what God said? Okay. Wait a minute. Angels never knew that. Angels are pure, right? You know, purified seven times language. They they say what's true. They totally rightly represent it. This whole double kind of innuendoism, saying two things at once. Yeah, yeah. She's uh yeah, she's pretty. Sarcastic. Sarcasm. Giving you two meanings or the opposite meaning by saying it, like my brother Rick used to say, the British are really good at insulting you with a compliment. <laughs> We're just really good at kind of being able to give a double message. Even it says there are six things that God hates in the book of Proverbs, and it's all nuances. The wink of an eye, the, the, the all these signs we give, all these nuances. He says he hates that. He hates that you can completely unravel something by just throwing in all these little innuendos. Like, oh yeah, yeah, he's uh, smart for someone who's never graduated school. Yeah, he's okay if you don't compare him to so-and-so. I mean, there's just ways to do this. And then God says, I hate a false testimony. It just goes on, you guys. And finally, at some point, God says, do not covet. And what's the word covet? Do not want something that I have not designated for you. Jealousy. I want this. How come they get this? I don't this. And then just lusting after something, even though nobody can see it. It's a process that happens internally. That happens to be the day of atonement. It falls in the 10th day of the day of, quote, awe or the days of the trumpets. So when we get into the feast of trumpets in the book of Revelation, you're going to see it's taking us through the process of introspection. God is testing us through trials and things that are happening in this world so your inner dialogue becomes revealed to yourself. Why? Because we tell ourselves good thing. What do we say? I'm a good person. They're screwed up, but I'm good. That's how we live through life. That's the fish we are. We kind of move through the medium of this life, making sure that everyone sees us well and other people in a diminished way. God says, that's not going to work on the Day of Atonement. Everyone accounts for themselves. Wow. Now it's the Day of Atonement. I'm down to thou shalt not covet. God, there's no hope for me. Help me. All I see is the sinful man that I am. Ah, the word affliction, ana, is where you get the word hanuk or Hanukkah. To dedicate yourself, then dedicate yourself to me. I'm your forgiver. I'm your sin bearer. I'm your redeemer. I'll forgive all of your sins. Just come confessing. That's what it means to have the, the quote, outpouring of the latter rain. All right, let's go back to our study. Interesting stuff, huh? This, these are the feasts. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And who wants to read on down a little bit? You did. You read. Okay. Who wants to read? So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and had, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to, to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. 
And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, <clears throat> to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Real quick, we're going to touch on this real quick. Physician, heal yourself. We're going to touch on exactly what they meant by saying that in just a sec. But go ahead. Keep reading. Verse 24. Then he said, surely, surely, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zerah. Zarephath. In the region of Sidon. Now, where is Jezebel from? Sidon. Sidon. All of a sudden, Elisha is sent to Sidon while Jezebel is in with God's people. That's interesting. Go ahead. The woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman and Syria. So all those in the synagogue, they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And rose up and thrust them, thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw the, him down over the cliff. Okay, stop right there. Why in the world did they want to throw Jesus off a cliff for saying this? He talks about Elisha. He talks about, you know, going to Sidon, and he's helping out a widow, and that was the only person he seemed to have helped. And then all of a sudden, they're like, this guy's going to die. That doesn't seem like a reason for capital punishment. So what was he really? And they use the phrase physician heal thyself. Where does that even come from? Literally, if you were to go into uh, like the Talmud and different things like that, they would use the phrase physician, physician, heal thine own limp. But it really comes from the phrase that they all knew. They're all in Hellenistic Greek culture at that time, especially Galilee. Galilee is called the circle of the Gentiles. All these Greeks live there, okay? So it's, you would know exactly kind of what the Greeks were thinking, the Greek thinking, the, the Hellenists. Well, it's coming from the story of Prometheus. Who knows the story of Prometheus at all? The Greek tragedy of Prometheus, where we get the idea of fire, right? Oh, that's the one who gave fire to humans. You get right. And he wasn't supposed to. He wasn't supposed to, right? Zeus said, "What are you doing? Giving fire to the humans? I'm going to destroy them." There's a great cosmic battle in the sky, and all the gods were warring. And then Prometheus decides to side as a titan with Zeus. It's kind of crazy, stupid story stuff. And then he says, "But kill the humans because if you give them light and fire, they're going to destroy themselves." They're going to just don't give them nuclear power, whatever they do, because they'll destroy themselves. <laughs> so Prometheus says, no, I like these guys. Humans are cool. Like they're kind of cute and they're funny. They're like little puppets, but they have like animation. They're like, they're like puppies. They're funny. They're silly. They do crazy things, but come on, let's give them fire. They're fine. And Zeus was ticked off. So he's, he's going to somehow punish this is the story. He's going to punish Prometheus by creating the first woman. Isn't this interesting? We're going to see all these weird stories come along. And her name was Pandora. Ooh, Pandora's box. Ah, right. And Pandora is trying to say to Prometheus, look at all the troubles you're creating with my box. Once this gets unleashed, it is going to be hell on earth. And so the story goes that Zeus sends a couple of uh, ruthless guys to go and basically to chain Prometheus to a rock. And this, and, the, and this is where the, the physician heal thyself comes from. 
Prometheus, you seem like you're very compassionate, like you love these people, but you're giving them too much light, too much knowledge. They're only going to destroy themselves with it. And look at all the suffering it's brought you, Prometheus. It's brought you a bunch of suffering and hell and everything else. Why don't you fix yourself before you go around fixing everyone else? You think these people can handle knowledge, but we gods can handle knowledge. And the Jews saw themselves as gods, the leaders, right? Remember, Jesus comes to them with, a, with this one of the Psalms saying, are ye not gods? Well, you see yourself as such. You're the ones that say, no, keep the people ignorant, right? It kind of sounds like certain churches I know. Only the priest class, the Nicolaitans, should be the ones that have the, the knowledge. And we will give you these nice little antidotes to kind of get through life and to be your placebo and to say, we'll be nice to each other and, you know, support the missionaries or whatever. But we're the ones that have the true knowledge. We are, that's where you get hermetics from. It's Hermes. Hermes, the god Hermes, the god of what? Knowledge and the transfer of that knowledge. Uh, that's that's Freddie Mercury. <laughs> so this is the idea, right? Hermes is a, he has the winged helmet, right? He delivers all these messages. And what what is Hermes saying? Hermes is basically saying this is a bad idea. You cannot give this kind of knowledge. So hermetics or hermeneutics, where you get seminaries from, it should be only be in these walls. The people cannot handle this kind of knowledge. Jesus, what are you doing? You are from Nazareth. No good could think of come out of Nazareth. Do you know what you are? You are a Prometheus, bro. You might know a bunch of stuff. And then there's this. So Aesop shortened the story about Prometheus and says, well, I got a story for you guys. It's a story about a, a frog. <laughs> Aesop's fables. You guys ready for this? A frog is using a bunch of his little chirp, chirp, fast language, blah, blah, putting all this stuff together. He sounds like he knows what he's talking about. But the picture is there's a fox sitting back there going, He's only fooling you guys. He sounds like he knows what he's talking about. And the, the leadership of the Jews were playing the fox because the fox would say, hey, frog, if you know so much, won't you fix your own problem? You're the one in, living in the mud, you know, but you're speaking to your very gullible little group because there's a rat there, there's a hedgehog, all listening to the frog going, he's so smart. And the fox is sitting back there. And Jesus says, go tell Herod that fox. They all thought that they were gods and they're smarter. They, you guys can't handle knowledge. Jesus was breaking off knowledge. He was enlightening the people. He was opening up the kingdom of heaven. And they're all saying, these guys are too ignorant to know. Go fix yourself. And Jesus says, listen, I got a parable. I got a story for you guys. We're in the days of Jezebel. This is the Elisha period. And guess what? I'm giving this Elisha message and I'm going to, a prophet's not accepted in his own, you know, Elisha was not allowed to be, guess what? I'm going to where Jezebel's from, and I'm going to go find me some harlots that are going to convert, namely Mary Magdala. I'm going to go get the un, what? The undesirables. I'm going to go to the lepers and to the Syrian king who had leprosy. I'm going to go to the lepers. I'm going to go to the prostitutes. I'm going to go to Sidon, and I'm going to get me my disciples. The spirit of God has been withheld from you people. The spirit of God is upon me, he said, right? He just said that. And they said, oh, are you saying that we are worshiping prophets of Baal? And that our great Herodias, the queenie, is a Jezebel? And Herod, who we love, that is building up Jerusalem. Remember, King Herod was building up Jerusalem as never before. It was finally becoming a great, great nation. It's called Herod the Great. No, this is one of, these are our best times. We're getting ready for the Messiah. Messiah's going to come. We're getting everything. We're, we're new construction everywhere. It's, it's an amazing thing. Look at this. We have this whole trolley and trans, and we have jumbo screens. We're all practicing, you know, for the big arrival of our great Messiah. And Jesus says, well, I'm he, and I don't approve. And you guys all get an F. They're all saying, you are no way. You are definitely not going to be the Messiah. He would appreciate all that we've done to prepare for him. And they were ready to throw him off the cliff. Is this fascinating? Yes. Crazy, crazy times. So go to James chapter 5, verse 7. Because again and again, this three and a half year, rain being withheld and the rain pours out, Elisha thing keeps coming up in reference to the end of time. 
And the book of Revelation is obsessed with this three and a half year period. James chapter five, verse seven. You guys cool enough? You want me to turn the air conditioning up a little bit? You guys okay? Mike, you all right? No, no, air conditioning. That's it. Oh, no, good. All right, that's good. Verse seven. James chapter five, verse seven. Just read on down for a little bit, whoever wants to. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. Ah. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing the, at the door. Stop right there. Does that sound familiar in the book of Revelation? Behold, I do what? I stand at the door and knock. It's your judge. It's a day of atonement. And this is the time of the early and latter rain. This is the time of Jezebel and Elijah the prophet. And the judge is saying, search your hearts. Let me come in and sit down with you. I'll sup with you. But don't be rich in increase of goods. Don't think you don't need me. Go ahead. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. We have heard of the per perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. That the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Merciful, Job. So Job is pictured as those who are standing at the end of time with the judge knocking at the door. And here are the patience of the saints. Job is your example. Job, Jonah. Those who enter into great darkness, who yet trust in God. That's the people that will endure at the end. Go ahead. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. And real quick, so what's yes, yes, and no, no on the priest's high breastplate? What are these two things right here called? Urim, Ur, means light. Im means lights, father of lights. And guess what James talks about? The father of lights. And looking in a mirror, and you'll see this is all day of atonement language. Or thumum, which means to cease or to end or to cut off or basically no or perfection. Like, no, that's the end of it. So let your urum be urum and let your thumum be thumum. When God says yes, that's the way to go. When he says no, leave it alone. These are severe times lest you fall into judgment. At the time of Elijah, it's decision time. I'm going to set father against, children against, in-laws against. These are times of decision, valley decisions. And guess two with the two in the field, two at the mill, two in the bed. One will be taken like they were taken in the flood. And then one will remain. It's about who remains and who will be taken. And these are critical times to make decisions. And Jesus is saying at the end of time will be a time where you're going to have to be making very unusual decisions. And the closest of relationships are going to be divided. You see, normally this is not what God does, but these are abnormal circumstances. You don't know the signs of the times. You don't know the times you're in. This is a tale between two cities, New Jerusalem, Babylon. This is a time between two women, the woman of the wilderness or the woman that sits on the scarlet beast. This is the time of the seal or the mark. You see, see how the book of Revelation is bringing you into a valley in which you are choosing and there's a severity in judgment. Go ahead. Uh, start with verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Stop real quick. This is extraordinary time where God is it's talking about Elisha kind of a time where he's doing all these things. And so even though these are barren times in which Elijah lived and he's living out the wilderness, he's wearing animal skins. He's being fed by a raven. He's he's drinking from a brook. He's all the way out in Sidon where Jezebel is from, her hometown. He's helping out a widow who is in starvation mode. And yet God is answering prayers. Isn't that interesting? Do you think this is going to be relevant to God's people at the end of time? 
Absolutely. Go ahead. Keep reading. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. Stop real quick. Before the disciples had the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what did they do? Remember, they're all fighting. Who's first? Who's the greatest? Who's going to be in the top seat, right? Who gets gold, silver, and bronze? So what did they do? If you go back to Acts chapter 1, what did they do? And now the Holy Spirit showed up. You just read it. They confessed their faults to one another. That's the missing link out of why we don't have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We don't come to terms with what God is trying to show us. Who are you to compare yourself to one another? Peter, I'm not like them. I have no Holy Spirit. He falls into a position where he is now denying Jesus Christ at a critical time. This is serious business here. We have got to approach one another as if we are all by nature condemned sinners and yet we're redeemed by one man's righteousness. Does that make sense? That's the only way we should be relating to one another. Nobody should be comparing themselves to one another. Now, if somebody is sinning, sure, you're going to see. You go alongside that person. You counsel them. You confront them. You deal with these things. But that's what we do because we are all in need of one great holy high priest. And we're there to draw each other away from presumption because the person sinning the most is the person saying, I'm better. I don't need you. I'm rich and increased of goods. The reality is, is that we are all in fellowship as condemned. That's why I love prison ministry so much. Everybody sitting around that table in orange jumpsuits and shower shoes for some weird reason had no problem calling themselves a sinner. And so they had no problem. I even would say, I don't know how many times I did I did prison ministry? How many years? I'm so glad we got so many prisons here. I can't wait to get started again. Because I would say, how many people here are not transgressors of the law? They're all looking at each other. No, really. No, you were framed. <laughs> you were framed. Meh, Shay, I was framed, Shay. I said, we're all sitting here in orange jumpsuit suits with shower shoes on. Who is here going to say, I didn't do it? We're all transgressors of, of the law. We are all in fellowship with the fact that we have pending legal consequences for this. We have only one hope that our great judge is also our advocate, who is also our true and faithful witness, who's also the one who will go and bear our consequences for our sins. Who wants to be under that, that jurisprudence? I want my judge, who calls himself my brother, by the way, who also is my advocate, Jesus Christ, who is also the true and faithful witness in the court of law, who happens to also be the one who is condemned on Calvary's cross for my guilt and shame. Who wants to be under that jurisprudence system? Every single hand shoots up. Do you think the Holy Spirit is in that room? Absolutely. You go to a church. How many people here see themselves as transgressor of the law? People are like, you know, maybe five hands will show. Everyone's going, yeah, exactly right, too. But there's no Holy Spirit there. God visits those who know their need. Jesus approach them all the time. You're blind, you're deaf, you don't know your need, you don't need us. Hey, you don't need a savior. Remain in your blindness, remain in your deafness. You're as good as dumb, dead. You're an idol. You're about as alive as those idols. There's no life in you because you know that when you have the Holy Spirit, you have nothing to boast of. You boast in your weakness, you boast in your infirmities, and you glory in God, right? That's if you have the Holy Spirit. So confess your faults to one another. Go ahead, Paige. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Stop. Is that powerful? Elijah saw himself 
as we should all see ourselves. He's a man of like passions. He gets the fact that he is a, what? A broken sinner who desperately needs God. And God answered his prayers, by the way. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much is a man of like passions. He's not talking about that Elijah is so righteous in himself. He's talking about that he was able to confess his faults to God. Guess who probably Elisha came in the name of the Lord, my holiness. He probably came in the name of his advocate saying, don't look upon me. I am nothing. But there is a great mediator for me. There's an intercessor. Based upon the fact that I have a high priest in heaven, answer my prayer. It's in great humility that God sends the Holy Spirit. God cannot trust the proud and he cannot, he resists the proud, he says. Isn't that what the scripture says? I resist the proud. But the humble, I answer those prayers every day, all day. And that's the one thing that it's interesting. We can talk about the Holy Spirit all day long. But the only reason we even have the Holy Spirit is because we confessed our faults to one another. We come to God as broken sinners. We don't compare ourselves to one another. And if any group of people is filled with pride and comparing yourself and hierarchy and I'm the pastor here or I'm the great prophet here or I'm the this and that and all this other kind of stuff, there's no Holy Spirit there. It's a false spirit. It's a harlot spirit. And so it's real interesting is that I'm not going to have us go. I'm going to kind of wrap up our study. The homework assignment, I hope you guys do it, is 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings... 18, 19, yeah, all the way to chapter 20, 21, because 18 to 21, and then there's more, because if you go to 2 Kings chapter 9, et cetera, et cetera, there's so much in regard to Jezebel finally gets hers, and it's all the way in 2 Kings, but it was because of the testimony of Elisha. Elisha confronted. The hardest thing in the world to do is to confront the spirit of these times. The spirit of Jezebel is powerful right now. It is enough to arrest even the greatest of the prophets, which was Elisha at the time. Enough for him to say, I just want to die. I cannot deal with this. Who wants to rise up against the narrative of our day? Nobody. It's too much to, to deal with. So the reason I bring this up is these are the issues of the judge standing at the door of the latter rain falling, the time which we enter into the patience of Job. We have this great reigning Jezebel spirit in the world now. And the really most of the sermons are prophets of Baal. Go along to get along. Don't confront. Just comply. Do what you have to do. And then guess what? Jezebel reigns. The prophets of Baal reign. But, and we'll just kind of end it with this thought. When Elisha confronted the prophets of Baal, what did he do to confront them? Like, what was it that he did? Who remembers where that was? Yeah, Mount Carmel, right. So what was it that he did? He didn't just go up there and preach a sermon. What did he do? Yeah. He challenged them, but he did it by setting up a what? Ah. Oh. He set up the altar and the whole burnt offering. If you want to get into the whole burnt offering, like we see it, we just kind of, our brain just kind of slides past it real fast. But the whole burnt offering was made up of three animals. You tell me what they represent. One was a lamb, one was a dove, and one was an ox. Three persons of the Godhead. L, ox. This is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are making a covenant to lay down their life to give us their righteousness so God can answer from heaven. Remember the fire coming down from heaven? That's where it's coming from. God answers us and accepts our offering if we're bringing the what? The whole burnt offering, which is what? The three persons of the Godhead. God is not looking for David's righteousness. God is looking for the righteousness that was provided in what's called the promissory covenant of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who all at the baptism of Jesus Christ all showed up. Did you notice that? When Jesus was baptized, the Father spoke, the dove showed up, and there was Jesus. You can't tell me there's no three persons of the Godhead. Bless you, by the way. They all jumped in on this covenant. They all went in. This was all the chips were in on this one, you guys. Why did God 
the, the entire godhood throw themselves in for our salvation because you know why? I would think because it would take nothing less than that to do it. You think God is interested in my righteousness? The Bible says the Lord, my righteousness. All three were involved in creation. So That's right. Us. We, us in our, right? right? They work in a oneness and a unity. They, they come together as an echad, like we should as the body of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Right? As one, because Christ is one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God help us to have the same mind that those three persons have with each other. You want to be brought into the fellowship, into the intimate fellowship. It's a great study. I wish I, we can do it sometime. The study of the word kodem, where you get the word condemn. And kodem is the same word translated east, like they were kicked out of the east gate, east of Eden, or everlasting. Jesus came from everlasting. Kodem is the picture of the zone you can't go into. It's the eternal zone. It's representational of the everlasting hills. It's a picture of where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it'll say in the Hebrew, that's where all the commandments come from. There's a zone that they commune in that we can't go in. There's two angels guarding it saying, don't even think about it. Don't even think about going in there. That's their place. That's where they commune. That's where Jesus says, I came from my Father's bosom, <clears throat> Kodem. And there's only going to be one opening of that gate. There's only going to be one creature ever allowed into Kodem. This is all great. This is a great Hebrew word study. Do you know what creature is going to be allowed in the place that it says angels desire to look into it? You'll see that phrase in the scripture. This is the place angels desire to look into, but they can't go. It's pictured by the two covering cherubs on the ark. Kodem, are you guys ready for this? Have you ever heard of Kadesh Barnea in the scripture? K Kadesh? Kadesh Barnea is where they failed to go into the promised land. So God made them go back to Kadesh. Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh is always the desert border towns. You might have a beautiful, lavish, flourishing, gorgeous oasis of a city. And then you have the desert that begins, right? It's desertification. It just, you just step into that area and you're in a place called Kodem. The death zone. And Kodem was always the picture of that's where God lives and no one else can live there. He lives in a place that's inhospitable to anybody else. You have to live on your own resources. And God is life. He, he is his own oasis. Isn't that interesting about God? He doesn't need a place. He is the place. Kodem is only going to allow one inhabitant into Kodem. And that's what the wilderness was called in the Old Testament, Kodem. Who traveled in the wilderness for 40 years? And who accompanied her? Anybody? The bride of Christ. When God's people were delivered out of Egypt, they were brought into a place called Kodem. They were practicing what it's like to go into the zone that even angels can't go into. There's no features out there. Jesus says, I'm the rock that followed them. I'm the bread that fed them. I was the canopy that covered them, and I was the, the heat <laughs> that warmed them at night. I was accompanying my bride, and I wanted to see if she wanted to live with me in Kodem. That I came from my father's bosom and I'm going back to my father's bosom and I'm going to take you there with me. It's a place that even angels can't go into, but his wife will. And she complained the whole time. You're going to where angels go, oh, I'm going to go down. You can't, don't even talk about it. That's a forbidden zone. Jesus says, but this is where my wife is going to be. That is what is pictured in the Holy of Holies. It's called the bedroom. The chambers where the shakin, the shekinah, the glory of God rests. <coughs> it's a place that's inhospitable to all creatures. And the price of saving us is that we're going to be made bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And where he goes, we go. 
we get to live and be with Jesus Christ in a place that no angel has ever seen before. This is the mystery of salvation. This is where it says it has not, I has not seen, you heard this phrase before? Ear is not heard. Nor has it even entered into the heart of a creature what's in Kodem. And that's where I have gone to prepare a place for, and you guys are complaining the whole time in your preparation. Don't murmur. I'm training you to live in a place that an angel would give up their wings to live there. And you were created below those angels, and you sinned against me, and you were under the pall of satanic delusion, and I'm going to redeem you, and I'm going to bring you to a place that no creature has ever been, nor will ever be, and you will be there as bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. We will become as one, and you will see things that no creature has ever seen before. And that's why he says, I swore in my wrath that they will not enter into that place because they complained the whole time. And the word wrath is the word for nostrils flaring. It means you hurt me. And it's interesting because they even said, you know the bread, the manna that you gave us? It's light. It's useless. There's no substance to it. I don't like it. I didn't like living with you. I don't like it. I want my flesh pots. I want my flesh pots. I want my melon. I want my garlic. And I want my onions. Right? Is that what they said? They wanted all their welfare food. The flesh pots was marinated meat. And it was what? What was the marinated meat? The throwaway meat, like the ribs and stuff. Yeah. It was marinated. Yeah, it was marinated meat. And they loved it. Marinated meat and garlic. And then on the side, they get melons. Does that sound like slave? It's slave food. And they were addicted to it. Man, who those chitlins and ham hocks. That's some good eating. And we get all caught up into this glamorizing our bondage. And it's sad. God says, don't you know that I am feeding you angels food? That's what the scripture says. I think it's Psalm 78 or something. I'm giving you from my king's table. And you're telling me that there's no substance to it. I am the manna. There's no substance to me. You were never sick. Your clothes never faded. Your shoes never wore out. And yet you complain the whole time. I wasn't enough. Jesus always comes to us. You guys ready for this? this we're going to wrap the study in this thought. Unadorned. What do I mean by unadorned? He's not coming with all the bells and whistles. If you're going to choose him as a husband. When Jesus came with a seamless garment to Jerusalem to be baptized at John, why did he come not on a white steed with all of his angels and his crown? Why did he come in a seamless garment, travel stained and worn? Who alone wore a seamless garment? You guys ready for this? A wife. That was what a woman wore on her wedding. See, the Nazarite was paying the dowry for a wife. Therefore, he grew his hair long and had to play the part of I'm paying for my woman's debt. I'm going to go and walk the journey that she failed in. I'm going to grow my hair long and wear a wedding garment. And whatever hardship, I will not drink of the vine. It's I'm not ready for the wedding yet. I've got to go and pay her price first. I'm a Nazarite. I'm going to grow my hair long. All the Jews had short hair. They're famous for it. They all wore linen clothes with a blue ribbon around the bottom. All of them did, except for the priests. And then they all had short hair. That was unheard of in ancient times. Only Jesus or our Nazareth had long hair because it was a picture of playing out what, the, what a woman should, you know, he's playing out by paying her debt by role play. And so he's going to go out and live a life that, she couldn't live and didn't live. And then he's going to, as a Nazarite, pay that price for her. That's what Jesus came and did, you guys. The righteousness that Jesus gave us is the perfect law of righteousness that is required of all of us. But he lived it out in himself. And then the day quote, the Nazarite is now finished with his vows. He says, it is finished. Sound familiar? 
And then they shave his head and his beard and everything else as a picture of dying and being born again. Just so we could go to Kadem. Just to pay the price and say, I'm one with her. I have shamed and humiliated myself. It was a shameful thing, Paul says, for a man to have long hair in Jerusalem. Paul says it himself. Go read it. Christ bore our shame. He came in a virtual wedding dress. That's why they gambled for it. And he came with long hair and he bore our sins. And we're too ashamed of Jesus Christ. Makes me ashamed to talk about it. He bore the shame. For what? To take us to a place that even angels wish they can go. That's our prize that we get from Jesus. So he comes unadorned, you guys, because he doesn't want us to want him for his things. What does he want us to want him for? Huh? Just for him. Could you imagine? Because do you think Jesus took us because of how great we are? <laughs> you know, when he came, we crowned him, didn't we? What kind of crown did we give him? Oh, that kind of sucks. We we gave him a, a, a we we gave him a robe. What kind of robe did we give him? A purple one of mockery. We gave him a staff. What did we do with the staff? Yeah, we beat him over the head with it, and we laughed. So, do you think that? Because we're so awesome is the reason why he came to get us. He says, I took you for who you are. How come you can't just take me for who I am? What, I'm boring to you? Do you know what we chase after? What's that eagle song? There's a new kid in town. We want Satan, man. He's coming all decked out, looking like he's really... Man, he is rolling, man. I mean, he is really, really got something going on here. He's the God of this age, the prince of the power of the air, man. He's got this whole thing dialed in. We're chasing after Satan because he looks so good and he smells so good. I mean, he's he's balling, right? He's a hustler. He comes rolling into town with his entourage. We're thinking, oh, I love that bad boy. Yeah, we have this sick bad boy love. Christ comes unadorned saying, why don't you just take me for me? Just for me, fall in love with me when I don't have anything, when I made myself poor so you could become rich. You guys, Jesus Christ is, is asking to accept him on the terms of just his character. If you don't love him, why would you marry him? If, you, if you're not enchanted with who he is as a person, why would you want to spend an eternity with him? This is all God wants you to do is just look at him for what he is, not for how people are trying to present him to you. Search out Jesus for who he is, and he's revealed himself in his word. See if you fall in love with him. Don't wait around for someone to present an image of Christ or a Christ that's really more like a Zeus figure, right? Jesus. Or some version of Christ. That's now palatable to you. He's the effeminate, all-inclusive, accepting, validating Jesus that never condemns anything. <clears throat> Don't wait for Jesus to be made in your own fantastic image. Seek Jesus for who he is, how he's revealed in his word, and then you can make a decision whether or not you want to spend an eternity with him. You're not going to be spending an eternity with the image of Jesus. You're going to actually be an eternity face-to-face -face with the actual Jesus. And if you don't love him here, what makes you think you're going to want to spend eternity with him? And guess what? The reason I think why people are going for an image Jesus is because I don't think they've really seen the true Jesus. Or I think to know him, you would love him. He's amazing. And the only people that I know that really love him, like love him for him, they received those qualities about Jesus in their own life. They experienced Jesus forgiving them. They realized that they've sinned against Jesus. They cried out to Jesus and he delivered them. Jesus has provided for my life, even in my hardest of times, in the most humble of situations. I was more thankful when I was in the homeless mode of my life where I was forsaken by everybody, my own family, my own church, it wanted me nothing. And I had to live on the streets and everything else. And believe me, the mercy of Jesus and the tenderness of Jesus while I'm hanging out in Salinas and Monterey, 
with nobody and nothing. Not even my own family would take me in. All based on rumors and all this kind of stuff. And I was saying, why are you doing this? He says, you're only going to receive from my hand. Every meal will be from me. Every interaction of a human being coming and showing you kindness will definitely be from me. And you're going to get kindness and a blessing in the way that I did. I had no place to lay my head. The birds had their nests. The foxes had their holes. But I had nowhere to lay my head. Do you want to receive the same piecemeal, humble pieces of manna bit by bit that I received? I'll comfort you with the comfort that I had, Dave. You said you wanted fellowship with me. Well, this is it. Because I'm thinking, you're rejecting me. You're abandoning me. You're leaving me high and dry. Look at all these people. Their life is awesome. They're flying, baby. They are just humming in their life. And now here I am stuck. No ministry, no people to teach, nothing. God says, well, this is an ordained stuck for you. Be patient. Because I want you to know what it's like to be with me. Unadorned. Does this make sense? So what is God going to do at the end of time? This is how... I want to finish this. He's going to put you in a place where you're going to be in the wilderness, literal, figurative, I don't know what. And he's going to be unadorned. You're going to either love him for who he is or you're going to reject him and take the kings of this world or fancy pants or twinkle toes or whatever. Because he's not Mr. Right, but Mr. What? Right now. Jesus says, I'm worth the wait. I'm worth the wait. Amen? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, please, Lord, teach us your ways. May it be your cologne that walks into the room, your incense, your smell. May it be your presence that we love. May we allow your hand to touch our hearts and our lives and our minds. Teach us to trust you, to follow you, to love your voice, that you're the shepherd and we are here to hear the true shepherd's voice. Guide us and lead us safely through this world. Bring us into that promised land. Teach us not to murmur nor complain, but humble our hearts, helping us to be satisfied, whatever our state is. That the most important thing is that we're following you and that we're trusting you in these great times of delusion and deception it's time, Lord, where there is so much there to draw us away from you. I pray that we fix our eyes upon you, no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.